Hey, hey, me Dwelly Podcast listeners, Stuart Anderson here. Just a short introduction to episode 13. Don't get superstitious and weird about number 13. It was a great episode. Everything is fine. Everyone is fine. A great, a great recording. We had Dan Mills on, uh, physical therapist, team member, sponsor of the team. He comes on and, and talks about injury, injury prevention, diagnosing injury, surgery, physical therapy. Who do you go to? How do you get help? Uh, a lot of great insight from Dan on how to stay healthy as a cyclist. So grateful for him. We spend about 50 minutes talking to Dan and sharing some uh, tips and things about injury prevention and how cyclists can uh, can do that. So big thanks to Dan. Thanks for listening. Grateful for everybody involved and uh, thankful for this great team. Hope you enjoy the episode. All right. Welcome, listeners. Stuart Anderson here recording for the Miduele podcast. This is episode 13. We're grateful to have you. Uh, we are talking today with brother Dan Mills. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Stu. And I've got Jake Cook with me and Spencer Chipping. What's up, dudes? What up, guys? Hey. How's everybody feeling after uh, a little Zwift this morning, Jake? Thanks for leading us, man. Dude, that was that was tough. Man, it was deep. I, I didn't think four laps. I mean, we did we've done six laps before, but oh. four was plenty, man. It was, and we had like thirty guys in there, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of so dudes. Can I say we're I maybe? Can I say we're maybe reaching the end of the of the Zwift season? Is that oh, fair please. to say? Outside can't come soon enough. <laughs> Dan, have you enjoyed it? Have you, I mean, your first time on Zwift, first season, has it been good? It's been fantastic, but I've learned some hard lessons and uh, I, I think I may have the record for number of glitch outs of Zwift. And, uh, <laughs> that's resulted in, I bought like the, the biggest internet connection available in my neighborhood. I've, I mean, my wife just rolls her eyes. It, you know, the, it's just like pulling the string in the sweater. And now mm-hmm. there, there are no excuses. I'm now out of excuses. I just call that carpool, Dan. Go down to the basement <laughs> and pedal. So it's carpool duty. Yes. It's funny how weird Zwift the Zwift setups can get. Trust me. I don't think my. I think my. I I might win with how weird mine is. So no, there's no judging here. <laughs> no, it's been great. I uh, I the the thing that really sparked it, uh, Derek Blazard. Uh, when he first started riding a couple of years ago, we we absolutely cleaned his clock going up Little Cottonwood, not intentionally, but he just hadn't been riding before. And he's a pretty fit dude. But uh, um, the way he remedied that was uh, he he got on Zwift and uh, and then Sufferfest and like another one, like three of them simultaneously and spent wow. the whole winter. And then we <laughs> rode that next March and he destroyed us. And uh, we're like, what? What have you been doing? And it had been all this secret training on the trainer secret inside. Secret training, yeah. We were like, oh, dude, mm-hmm. secret training. That's no well, point. So I knew after, that um, it was just a matter of time. So this is the season to do it. Well, after that Volar meetup this week, Tuesday night, I had five or six people, just randoms, that were like, hey, I got to do this. I got to get in with you guys. Like, what are shout you doing? Out John Love. So, yeah, John, <laughs> shout out that to John. Awesome. <laughs> so good. Hey, well, I'm going to introduce Dan uh, just with a short story, and this is uh, kind of my idea here for why we want to talk to him today. Um, so last October, so ni- 2019, I'm playing spike ball on the beach uh, with Chip. Chip was there, and I hyperextend my left knee uh, on the beach, and it was like not a traumatic injury. I wouldn't call it like I was like, I mean, Chip, I just I kind of kept playing. It wasn't the worst thing ever. Um but I got home and my knee was super sore, kind of weird. It kept locking. Like when I'd go downstairs, I'd lock out and hyperextend. And so I went, I went and visited Vern Cooley because I was like, well, I got to see a surgeon. Who else do I see for knee help? And Vern was like, well, you have a, you know, he's 90% sure I've got a torn ACL. And he puts me on the calendar for surgery. And I was like, okay. And I started talking to other people that had their ACLs torn. And they're like, listen, your injury does not sound like an ACL tear. It's like when you blow your ACL, it's like, you know, it's blown. And, you know, Jake was even one of those. Jake hurt his ACL in, in, uh, in college. Jake, was it high school or college? Uh, it was actually, uh, it was high school. It was back in 2000 or not, actually no college, sorry, college in, two, in 2012. So I had known Dan uh, through guys on the team, as well as Dan and I rode Lodija one year 
uh, together. We didn't really, I, I only knew him from his kid. Um, and so I went and saw Dan and I mean, he opened my eyes to injury, injury prevention, who you're trusting for opinion and what happens like when you get hurt, whether it's a cycling injury or I don't know, lifting sod in your backyard. I hate to say it, but cyclists are the most, I told Dan this, I think that we're the most unfit fit people that do sports. You know, it's like, congratulations on sitting on a bike for six hours, but now pick your kid up and it like blows your back out. So, <laughs> uh, so this is why I wanted to talk to Dan. We're going to talk about injury prevention, opinions when it comes to injuries, how cyclists can prevent injury, and maybe some tips and tricks from Dan on what he's seen for backs, for knees, for hips, for necks, uh, and just kind of keeping us healthy when it comes to uh, riding the bike. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Mm -hmm. I also didn't get surgery, and my knees are super good, in my opinion. So thank you, Dan. Did you, did you get an MRI, Stu? Before yeah, you got got an got an MRI and cool. I mean, Cooley told me it was torn. MRI showed that it was not torn. Uh, it was just a partial tear. It is loose though. I mean, Dan diagnosed it too. It's like a loose knee, but certainly not a destroyed ACL joint. That's so interesting that it, you know, the MRI showed not torn, but then he tells you it's torn. I mean, that just seems not right. Mm, we're gonna get into that, Jake. Just yeah. wait. <laughs> Dan, will you tell mm. us a bit about? Um, your background, I mean, you are an avid athlete. Will you tell us a little bit about your family, your cycling, your business history, and everything um, that uh, you want to share? You bet. Well, I first of all, I'm honored to be doing uh, number 13. I, I glad, I'm glad this isn't like a <laughs> where you know, they have like 12B or 14A, uh -huh. uh, which, by the way, I, I looked it up. There's a diagnosis. The, the reason for that, the reason they don't have 13 because there's a diagnosis there's a diagnosis for that for people that have a fear of the 13th floor is called oh triskaidekaphobia oh so my gosh that might I be a good name for the i hope you don't skip this podcast because you've got triskaidekaphobia i'm gonna name that that's the name of this podcast i'm gonna write that down there you go i'll <laughs> I'll, I'll send it to you later so okay. yeah, i uh i've got i've uh, got a long history in this area i grew up in conwood heights and you know, was one of those kids that thought I'd move away and never come back. And uh, here I am growing up probably about a mile from the house I grew up in. And um, my, uh, my professional life took me to uh, uh, BYU, the University of Utah, um, Idaho State University, um, a little bit of time in Great Falls, Montana, and then Iowa State University. Uh, before having an opportunity to come back to Utah and open up my own spot. And I started out at, in sports medicine, and then that grew into occupational medicine, with, which is workers' comp injuries, and went from one to two to five clinics in a hospital contract in a pretty short period of time. And um, that, that went away. It was a, it was a business uh, Kind of the ups and downs of business, you know, when you hit your wagon to other groups and things changed and I came out relatively unscathed, but needed to reinvent myself and decided to go back to my sports medicine roots. So back to outpatient orthopedics and opened a place in Cotwood Heights with the, with the basic premise that I was going to do it ideally. I'd watched it in training rooms and you know, some of the big locals, both the private clinics as well as Tosh and the U and, um, and the IHC system. And I thought, you know, there, there's just a lot of pressure on the therapist to do more with less and do it in a really short period of time. And the billing structure and uh, the supervision and things have changed a lot. And I just said, you know, I just, if I do this by myself, I limit the overhead all I have to focus on is taking care of people and I don't have to play the games. And so that's yeah. kind of where I'm at right now is I, yeah, it's not nearly as much money as I used to make, but I get to do it exactly the way I want to do it. And after, you know, close to 22 years, um, I can't believe I get paid to do it. Number one. And number two, I absolutely love it. Um, and, uh, and I feel like I've gotten better at it as time goes on. My personality is such that I, I suffer from serious FOMO. And being in a solo practice, I worry that I'm going to miss out on things all the time. So 
that led me to get involved with my national association. And um, one thing led to another, starting with kind of state involvement and then uh, kind of chapter involvement. And then um, uh, long story short, I'm on the board of directors for the American Physical Therapy Association, which I, I'm really proud to represent my profession in for a five state area in the Western United States and kind of bring that back to Utah. The main thing that does for me personally, though, is that it basically gives me a bat line to my colleagues around the country if I have a question to make sure that I'm not just coming up with local yokel ideas that, mm. you know, I'm getting access to the very best stuff that's out there. So nice. Very cool. And one thing I love about Dan uh, to go along with it is I think he also, you walk your talk. Is that right? Walk your talk. I mean, Iron Man's dude, tell us about your, your history as an endurance athlete. Well, my, my brother told me about the, his experience at the St. George, the full, the year that they had like three foot white caps and uh, half the people DNF'd and the guy who won the race got literally blown off the course, hopped on his bike and ended up still winning it. And I said, well, Joel, how did that go for you? He's like, that was the worst decision of my life. And I said, that sounds Perfect. great. I think I want to do it. <laughs> he was a, he was a one and done and I'm just kind of stupid that way. So I've done nine halves and seven fulls. And, oh my gosh. Oh, I, I, uh, I guess I love, I love time in the pain cave as much as anybody. So how many, lo how many loadages, Dan? Uh, I think I'm nine now. So. Nine. But the interesting thing that I learned from Dan when I went there is he has an injured knee. I mean, your one of your knees is very injured. Um, and it was some interesting advice that he picks his battles when it comes to training and racing on a knee that's hurt. Can you talk about that for a sec? You bet. You bet. I mean, I, I was a runner for many, many years. And truth be told, if, if my knee had held out, I probably would just be running marathons and doing nothing else. And uh, I, I actually gave up skiing for a lot of years, for probably 10 years, because it just tweaked my knee too much. And um, I, I knew enough biomechanically that cycling was good for me, but I had, uh, I had a really bad attitude about dudes in spandex for a long time. <laughs> I'm going to a, a support group for that now. And uh, that's a, I'm over that. And now I've embraced my spandex life, maybe to uh, too much. my wife doesn't appreciate all the time, but you know, I, it's a, it's been an interesting road to find out how cycling, not only, um, was a good alternative to running, but it actually, and we'll talk about this more, but the cycling actually is therapeutic for my knee. Um, mm. When I cycle, I can run more. When I cycle, I can ski harder. When I cycle, I can, I've been able to run around with my kids and, you know, run the Grand Canyon from rim to rim. And why, why is that Dan? Run, and go canyoneering with my, with my kids and his teenage friends and, not only keep up with them, but, you know, many times, you know, they're trying to stay up with me. So I just initially just chasing kids. So Jake, do you want to ask again? Yeah. I just said, what, why is that Dan? Um, the, there's something magical about low load, high repetition activity. And so this, this goes into, and I don't know if you guys have covered this in detail on the podcast, but from a training planning periodization standpoint, Sometimes we just all want to put the hammer down and we just want to go hard all the time. It's like, you know, uh, max out the Watts, how close am I to my FTP and my red line in it. And frankly, the, the most therapeutic things, and I, I need to do better at this, but, you know, stand down around 120, 150, that's like squirting WD-40 into your knee joint. Mm. And it's, we, we sometimes get that on the downhills organically, you know, doing the doing the um the immigration morning constitutional the the great thing about that is just spinning your legs out with your with your buds doing you know 35 45 miles an hour down there it, it may not feel like your heart rate's doing much but that's that's actually adding life to your knees nice wow. so good. saying not go hard all the time <laughs> no <Yeah>. i <laughs> i would this love to say that i'm good at that but my Garmin tells me I'm very bad at that. <laughs> so yes, Jake, do that, not what I do. What about, is, oh, go ahead, Chip. Contrary to each Zip, Zwift ride each morning is right. Almost exactly, exactly. So um, 
the reason I, I mean, one of the, one of the reasons I thought this would be interesting to have down on is um, because I think that we are, I mean, we've all reached an age, unless you're like one of these young guys who you can remain nameless, but I mean, Dan says like you look inside a young or older guy's knee and over time, it's just, it happens. It's going to get weird. It's going to wear out. I mean, Jake, talk about your injury. I mean, what happened to your knee when, I mean, yeah, so I, I was I was actually skiing. Mine was a skiing accident. I like to play around in the park, um, so I hit some jumps, get some air, and and I just came down basically flat, and, and my, I almost did like the splits when I landed, and I just felt my knee go right in, and I felt the pop. So hmm. as soon as I felt the pop, I knew something was wrong, and it was just very unstable, and mine swelled up like a huge ball. I mean, I knew something was wrong then, and um, obviously burned coolie. And, and this happened again back in 2012, so – you know, from 10 years ago, you know, to where it is now, I'm sure there, you know, Dan can talk about, you know, what's the direction of medicine go now, but then it was to get it fixed. And so you know, the first person that I saw was Dr. Cooley and um, kind of the same experience as Stu walked in and within no joke, probably 10 seconds, he's like, yep, you got a torn ACL. Let's get you in for surgery. And, you know, next week later, it was surgery and, you know, eight months recovery to get it done. But I do feel like my knee is, 110%. I mean, I do still yeah. feel like I've, I've gotten some meniscus issues, just pain coming, but uh, I did get the full reconstruction. So ACL, MCL and meniscus. But uh, I think now, I mean, given your situation, Stu, I mean, hearing your story and talking with Dan on the phone prior to this, it's, I probably have different feelings. If I were going to, you know, if I did tear my knee again, I'd have some different, yeah. different feelings towards it. Well, that's, I think why it's fun to learn. That's why, I mean, maybe why we're doing this today is options a friend in the physical therapy world, uh, a teammate who's willing to offer an opinion that you know is not like biased and weird, uh, which is a good thing to talk about. How about you, Chip? I mean, injuries, what do you yeah. work with? What, what were so, you? So um, I, it was a few years ago as well. And I had a shoulder pain that I could not rid. And I went to four different specialists, including uh, famous uh, Max Testa, um, and then had uh, a cortisone shot just so I could bear the pain. Wow. And uh, it was, and so I thought that it was my fit, but my fit, I had been over and over and over. I even went to a more uh, wider uh, bar size to more narrow to try to figure out my fit. Then went with the cortisone shot to get through some racing and and as I learned that through um, massage therapy, rolling it, rolling it literally religiously, two times a day, I was rolling it out. Um, I could slowly feel it kind of go back into place. And mm -hmm. I was even coached on how to, how my posture was important while going through the rolling and massage therapy so that it wouldn't fall back into place. And, uh, you know, all of this coming from, uh, what Dan is is speaking about. We, we have a lot of control, Dan, is what I basically learned about our body on how we can self-maintain. And that's so helpful to us. So, I mean, Dan, from your perspective, maybe we can move into part two here is like what mistakes are guys making that are maybe causing injuries in this sport? So maybe maybe the first one, and this this may tie in a little bit to some of Spencer's comments a little bit, and, and frankly, stuff that all of us fight a little bit. Um, cycling by its very nature uh, puts you into a fixed position. And we all know that, that, that adjusting your bike fit, you know, that's something you want to do way, way, way outside the season because you lose wattage. You know, you, you, your body accommodates to that. And even just a change in cleat position can make you really, really much less efficient because you're using mu different muscle groups. Yeah. So if you haven't had that experience, go, you know, mark, mark where it is first, but, you know, go adjust your saddle up or down a couple of millimeters and uh, pay attention to your next Zwift ride. I think <laughs> we'll quickly move it back to where you were. <laughs> now, all that being said, you know, you, the, the, the benefits of, of being locked in that position also can create all sorts of problems. And, the body is not meant to be in a static position, even though our legs are moving and uh, our handlebars have options. Um, it's really, really important to understand that 
um, the, the first mistake is trying to just figure out where is the optimal position to be and just lock it in 100% no matter what. That this is where, this is, I put my hands on the hoods, I bend my, my elbows at like 10 degrees, I have my neck in this position, I make sure I don't drop my heels, and then I lock that in for the full nine hours of Lodija. And that's, that constitutes a win. You know, and that, unfortunately, there's a, there's a part of our human nature that, um, that is predisposed to go that way. I mean, those of you who participated in other types of coordination sports, I mean, if you played soccer, for example, the way that you learn how to kick a soccer ball as a kid starts out being broken down into like, you know, 20 different components. Well, by the time you're a high school or even a collegiate soccer player, your brain has a motor pattern for that that just basically says, kick the ball, you know? Mm-hmm. It's no longer these individual 20 steps. It's just like if you watch a little kid when they're first starting to walk, they have this really wide base of support. Their feet are really far apart, hands are wide, and it's this you know, big clunky Frankenstein type of gait. The problem is, it, which is also a benefit to us, we get really, really efficient. So the first mistake is that we, we feel like we gotta get locked in and we never change. Mm. Now, the, the easy and short solution to that is that, you know. If, if your handlebars were not meant to be used, you just have hoods and nothing else. Bar tape is there for a reason. You should be moving from the tops of the hoods to the backs of the hoods, to the, to the corners of the bars. Go down into the drops once in a while. And it doesn't have to be when you're screaming down Immigration Canyon, you don't have to wait for that. You know, Go to the, to the ends of the, the drops. Um, go sink really, really far into the drops. And then make sure that you're not bearing weight in the same part of your palm. People will be like, oh, my hand's going numb. And my first three fingers, I've got carpal tunnel syndrome. I need carpal tunnel surgery. No, you just need to not just lock into the bar. Or, or I need really, really fancy, expensive gloves. Mm-hmm. No, just move your hands a little bit. Your nerves don't like, you know, your hands are not meant to be a primary weight-bearing surface. Mm-hmm. The other solution is that maybe, and, and Max Testa is a, is a freaking genius but he also spends a lot of time with really elite athletes. So, which, you know, at 49, I like to think I'm the bomb still, but uh, I'm probably not. And I probably haven't been for quite some time. And so the idea that I need a pro bike fit, um, that would be a disaster for me. I mean, that's going to result in me herniating discs in my neck and in my low back, my shoulders are going to hurt like Spencer's. I'm going to end up with, you know, bursitis. And then I'm going to wonder why do I have all these muscle imbalances? Well, because a pro cyclist at you know 26, 28 years old um, is is potentially getting paid an awful lot of money to beat the tar out of their body, and the incremental yeah. difference in terms of performance is so small, it's just not worth it. So maybe that maybe the biggest single one is uh, is that we're we're fixed in that position and we don't realize that we actually do have some flexibility within the bike. Um, two through five would be more things related to. Uh, equipment decisions that uh, we think are a great idea because we read it on a blog or our favorite, our favorite pro rider is doing it or our, our buddy that we've been riding with for 10 years is telling us, dude, you're an idiot if you don't have a whatever. If you didn't put a flux, a flux capacitor on your bike, you're an idiot, you know. Um, so that's a mistake, you know. Uh, and sometimes the, I would say maybe number four is uh, – that you don't, we don't give ourselves adequate rest and uh, understanding that literally you are leaving Watts on the table. If uh, like those of you, those of you this, uh, this week, for example, that did, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, if you did nothing tomorrow and, you know, some form of cross training Saturday and Sunday, you're going to kill it on Monday. But on the other hand, if you're like, well, by Saturday, I'm recovered. I'm going to do a hundo because I want to just, you know, I just I'm feeling it. I'm feeling good. You kind of pay a price for that kind of stuff. So uh, inadequate rest. And then number five, and you guys have covered this before in previous podcasts, is uh, completely um, underrating how much nutrition is a factor. So that would be my five. Nice. Mm. And then, I mean, nice. there are, there, um, there are some very specific things that I often hear, um, you know, problems with it that I don't know if it's just the fit, but one is like a, a sore lower back. Um, you know, I, 
if I were to total the amount of time a day that I, if you're watching me on the video, that I just am sitting in this dumb position all day. I mean, I go from bike to breakfast table to work, you know, to car to at home on my couch, always in this like hunched. Um, any thoughts on that, like that guys can be doing to prevent that? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting point, Stuart. And the, the, the thing that I think is fascinating is um, as our lives get more mechanized and our, our, our teammates are a pretty educated group of guys. And so uh, there, there aren't a lot of blue collar workers, I don't think in our bunch, uh, which means that we're all doing a lot of sitting. And uh, one of my colleagues said probably 15 years ago that sitting is the new smoking. And we mm. kind of have to treat it that way. We, mm. we have to kind of engineer changes in position into our daily lives in ways that we've never had to before. And so if you love, love, love the bike and you're not gonna be a runner, you're not gonna be a swimmer, you're not really into, you don't have a lot of other outdoor hobbies or just you know, in order for you to spend the time on the bike that you'd really like to, other things are going to get excluded. You've got to engineer in some changes in position. It can be a standing work desk. It can be, you know, those treadmill work desks that they don't give you motion sickness. Um, but at the very least, putting an alarm on your computer so you're changing positions. And then in terms of your bike fit, you know, sometimes if you're if you're really extended out, if you're really really lengthened out, just realize that uh, we all know bi biomechanically that makes you more stable, especially on a descent with a crosswind. Um, it's fantastic, but to Spencer's diagnosis, that's really hard on your shoulders and uh, a more compact, uh, and again, I don't wanna to get too far into bike fit here, but um, a, more, a more compact setup can sometimes decrease the pressure on your lumbar discs as well. Mm. An another technique, just in terms of just kind of pro tricks is making sure that you're paying attention to how much curve there is in your low back as you're riding. And you should have a whole myriad of options for how you sit on your bike. There should be ways that you, you kind of arch your back and kind of really curve it like a pro, like your chin's down, right down onto your handlebars, even when you're ascending. But other times when you're sitting, uh, it's not full up sitting up, but that you've really tried to create that curve in your low back just to relieve your discs a little bit. And there nice. are easy ways to tell if you're doing well at this. If you're getting numbness and tingling into your feet, the first thing you should suspect is that Maybe I've got too much curve in my low back and I'm getting a little bit of minor pinching of the discs. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the canary in the mind. You can, you can vastly avoid back surgery with just some minor changes. Sometimes it's just, you just move your saddle anteriorly, maybe five millimeters, or, you know, it, maybe it's time that, you know, that super, super aggressive cockpit that that neck needs to be angled up a little bit. And you, you got to get the old man, uh, old man cockpit. You know, <laughs> and just remember, I mean, retirement stems. go ahead, Jake. We call those retirement stems. Retirement stems. Yes. Oh, well, I, I would say retirement or uh, how about disc preservation stems? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I know Jake and Dan, um, they connected right before, I mean, a little bit before we, we got on, uh, you know, we're going to bring up religion and politics here in Dan's opinion. Uh, how do we how do we transition into surgery versus physical therapy? Because you know there's guys listening now with severe injuries that they're just saying, you know, how do you decide? What's the road you go down, Dan? Well, so and and just in light of my conversation with Jake, just to kind of describe the the landscape and understanding that we have a couple of dwellers that are um, that work in this space in different categories, and I'm a pretty pretty broad approach therapist. Um, I, I feel like there's room for massage therapy. There's room for acupuncture. There's, there's room for orthopedics. There's room for sports medicine. There, there's room for chiropractic. But um, the, the landscape has changed a little bit. Orthopedics 20 plus years ago involved a fair amount of conservative treatment. And unfortunately, the healthcare system has made it so impossible for even the very, very best meaning docs to see these conservative patients, they, they just don't, they make zero money on those office visits. And so as a result, if you're gonna be an orthopedic surgeon and deal with all the costs associated with running an orthopedic practice, it's really hard to see people in your office that are non-surgical. And also every moment that you spend with a patient that's not anesthetized, 
you're losing money, which is a really, really hard situation for these guys to be in. So the, first of all, the orthopedists are put in an untenable situation. Second of all, the physical therapy profession has, uh, we've really worked hard to gain credibility in the musculoskeletal space. Our desire is to be the primary care specialists for all musculoskeletal conditions. The idea is that you go see a PT first before you go see anybody else. And mm -hmm. let us help find out if it's a bone, a ligament, a tendon, a muscle, a biomechanical uh, problem, a, a pain issue. And then let us help figure out which of those disciplines might be helpful to you. Maybe it's the massage therapist. Maybe it's the chiropractor. Maybe it's the acupuncturist. Maybe it's the orthopedic surgeon. And we're going to try to help you figure out which of those disciplines is going to be most helpful. And also, we're going to listen to you in terms of uh, what your goals are, because there, there's a there's kind of a scale in terms of how this stuff is treated. We if we take ACLs because we've kind of gone there a little bit, we take like a, a contrasting Stuart and Jake's experience here a little bit. Um, Jake was treated with the absolute standard of care. That I mean, you know, he had a, one of the very best surgeons that we have in our marketplace, and and they both saw the same doc. You know, he's a he's a great doc. Um, uh, however, you know, if you go to his office, he's presuming you've already made the decision. You know, if, if basically if the special tests validate what I'm thinking, you want to schedule surgery. And number two, I really want to spend as little time in this office as I can, not because I don't like you, but because I'm literally losing money on these, on these days that I have to see patients. So mm -hmm. the reality is that from a physical therapy standpoint, first of all, we don't have a horse in the game. I don't care whether you have surgery or don't have surgery, but my ability to, to do the special tests, to, to move your knee, to find out if you have an ACL tear is uh, I think pretty trusted, including trusted by the same orthopedic surgeons that are going to potentially be cutting on you, um, number one. Number two, then in the state of Utah, in the last uh, five years, uh, the legislature is allowing PTs to prescribe x-rays and MRIs, which means that, you know, when you're, when you're asking that question, okay, I, I do need to know if it's torn or not. Um, I really want that data point, you know, we can, we can help you with that as well. And then you go to the, to what are the consequences of having the surgery or not having the surgery and is it time sensitive? So an ACL, for example, is not a time sensitive injury by itself. Um, if your knee swells up like crazy, it feels really, really miserable, but this isn't like one of those things where you go to the ER and they're going to take you step straight to surgery and they're going to call the surgeon off the ski slope so that he can come to your surgery right this second. It's not that kind of an injury. It's really traumatic because it's, it's painful, right, Jake? Yeah, for sure. But it's not, it doesn't warrant, you know, you know, we're going to, we're going to take you at three o'clock and nobody gets their ACL reconstructed at 3 a.m. on the weekend. Let me put it that way. So they're not cracking your chest. You know, this is, this is a ligament in your knee. So um, the extreme of that is that, you know, in, in reality, an ACL is, um, is typically better done once the swelling has gone down and the reconstruction turns out better if you wait 30 days or longer, which means that there's an argument to be made, just like in Stewart's case of, let's see how much you can stabilize it on your own. And there's some fantastic data coming out of the UK. It's not as popular here because you can, you can imagine why that um, non-surgical treatment of a torn ACL is not very popular with people that make money off of torn ACLs. But um, there's some good data showing that the right patient can actually do just fine without an ACL. And if you've got a partially torn ACL, there's really no benefit to going in there and having them chop the rest of it off and reconstructing it unless there are certain situations and circumstances that, that um, occur. And I would, I would say that uh, in contrasting Stewart's situation, I have a patient that uh, that's going to have surgery on an ACL in a week. And, um, but he's a, he's a pro skier that uh, has enormous laxity in the other three major knee ligaments. And he is so sloppy and so loosey goosey, and there are no muscle imbalances. Um, and even that kid, even that kid, as recently as yesterday, said, "You know, my knee actually feels really, really awesome right now." 
Uh, the only limiting factor for him is that the discipline of skiing that he does involves doing a lot of crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. And to tolerate the, the forces that he's going to put on it, these are not amateur level things. It's, it's crazy level. And right. he has the potential for somebody to pay him seven digits to do it, which I don't know that any of us uh, are probably in that, that category. Although in my mind, I am. So we collect a lot of Miduele fees. So it's, I mean, it's important. It's essential. You're kind of a high roller, really, Stu. Let's yeah, right. Uh, I think that was a good argument. Any, any other thoughts there, you guys, on on making that decision? I mean, I because I assume everyone that's listening has an injury. You know, my wife had injured knees that we had to make this decision. It's not easy to decide what to do. So any other thoughts? Stu, mine, mine would be uh, step one, go see Dan before right. step two, right? <laughs> step one, go see Dan and, and figure out, uh, how you can fix potentially what is injured before going to step two. Yeah. And step I, two might I mean, be a great alternative, which is learn how to self, um, manage and take care of a, of an injury, uh, which is really good education for the long haul as you are, um, you continue to try to progress as a, as an athlete. Maybe I can address hey, the, one of the fears that people generally come in with. Um, did you, yeah. did I at any point tell you to stop pedaling? No, no, just, uh, I mean, you they, told me. They're so used to the doctor saying, um, well, if your knee hurts, just, just stop biking. And that's when a typical guy in our club is going to say, peace out. I will never see you again. And I'm going to go get on my bike right now. <laughs> and I, my, my attitude, especially 20 years in is that there, there are very, very few circumstances that I would say you need to stop pedaling for a little bit. That that's just, that's a rare, rare situation. Even then, usually my attitude is, you, you go do you and I'll put you back together on Monday morning when you come in. Mm. I like that. Okay. Um, maybe as we kind of wrap up, Dan, I would love to hear, um, I, I've said this before and I got it from Tyler Hamilton's book that, uh, you know, there's a lot of imbalance when it comes to the upper end of the sport. And I think that a lot of guys who ride in this, in this team are kind of borderline there not pros, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of uh, unbalanced bodies that ride. What, what can these, what can listeners do tomorrow after they ride Zwift or Saturday, whatever, that everyone needs to be doing to stay healthier, more balanced, stronger? Any thoughts there? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really easy question and a common conversation in the, in the clinic. Whatever form of exercise you hate is probably the one that you should be doing. <laughs> so, and at, that hurts, right, boys? I don't want to run. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it may be, it may be that uh, you don't like the weights. You don't like hitting the weights. You know, it's like, oh, those knuckle draggers staring at the mirror. You know, I don't, I don't need to be standing next to my rotato chip watching my biceps get bigger. That's just not my thing. Um, but you know what, maybe lifting some weights is going to help deal with the muscle imbalances that are causing you to be hunched over that result in you needing cortisone shots. And, uh, you know, and, and it may be that, uh, that some yoga to open you up a little bit to address mm -hmm. the flexibility and uh, using the argument that, you know, I inherited my, my, my dad's hamstrings and my knee doesn't go there. Um, that argument doesn't apply, you know. It needs to start with figuring out where are the muscle imbalances. And really the, the benefit, the true benefit to that is that if you're not, if you don't have a strong upper body and you're a super quad dominant athlete, that you're a soccer player, you're a, you're a football player, you're an X track athlete. Um, it's really likely that your quads can kick your hamstrings, butt, so to speak. Um, and by not involving your hamstrings a little bit more, you're actually leaving money on the table. And, and frankly, as much as like five, maybe even 10% of your, of your wattage that could be, you know, added to by addressing muscle imbalances that goes to core strength as well. When you're, 
when you're really, really standing up in the pedals and really trying to just max out your watts, man, if, you're, if your abs and your transverses abdominis and your rectus spinae are solid, um, suddenly you're, you've got another gear compared to everybody else. So from a purely competitive standpoint, um, it's gonna help. And, and then uh, you add to things like yoga and, uh, and weight training, things that are weight bearing. Um, one of the downsides with cycling is that we just don't get enough weight bearing through our joints. And so it doesn't have to be running per se, but it should be hiking or going for walks, um, maybe a little bit of trail running. And if you've got some degenerative changes in your knees, you have to kind of monitor that, but you should be getting, you know, like the 10,000 steps a day that's not just for cardio, that's, that's for weight bearing. And those striations in those, in those bones, there's really good data that shows that whatever you're doing in your 20s, 30s, 40s is gonna pay huge dividends. When they look at the striations of like 80 year olds and 90 year olds in terms of uh, how strong your bones are so that, you know, just like your grandpa or your great grandpa, when they slip and fall and just completely like annihilate their hip they bounce up and they didn't break their hip. Um, the person that didn't break their hip in many cases is the one that did some really aggressive weight bearing exercise. So mm. marathon runners, for example, uh, maybe maybe more males than females don't break a lot of hips in their nineties. And so finding the right combination of weight bearing exercise to tie in there too. Um, and then just making sure that, um, that you're always looking at your bike fit and uh, that you're, you're moving around. You should be like a, a caged animal on your bike. If you're not using, if you find that just in terms of the, um, the bar tape, if the bar tape is only getting dirty in a certain area, you're doing mm. it wrong. Mm. You should be moving around. And uh, that's an easy little self-assessment. If you look and it's like, yeah, there are parts of my bar tape, Dan, I've never even touched before. <laughs> it's purely cosmetic on that part. You know, <laughs> we've all, we've all got that, you know? So and then recognize that you know your your bike fit should be modified a little bit every year. You may find that you've got to bring your saddle forward just a little bit. You may need to bring the cockpit up just a titch. And by bringing it up, just realize it's not going to appreciably change things. Realize that your ability to get down into a tuck or the forbidden now forbidden super tuck um, is largely based on um, how low you can bend your elbows, not necessarily where the actual handlebars are. So it's not like, you know, if you go to the old man cockpit that you can't still have that glory filled moment of passing a 25 year old going up, you know, little cottonwood and leave him standing still, you know, that still is there. That's still possible. Nice. <laughs> nice. Hey, I am interested, um, Chip and Jake, um, what, what do you guys do to stay balanced? It might be interesting to share that. Me to go, Chip? Yeah, absolutely. Stu, I, I have always enjoyed weights. I have always enjoyed uh, yoga. Um, I played college soccer and still spend a lot of time coaching and running with, with the kids. So I'm, I am not a runner per se, but I spend a fair amount of time training while running. So um, after Zwift currently... You're already in your pain cave. I do have weights down there and I do have a yoga mat down there. So after a two hour ride, I go directly to my floor where I get the weights. I use eight a pounders. kettlebell. Eight. <laughs> what was that? Eight pounders. <laughs> eight pounders. <laughs> I, I use the kettlebell. I use the hand weights. Um, and I really love to jump rope. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then, and then I wrap it up though, with a good session of stretching. And then for my day of rest on Sundays, I'll just add this, my favorite thing to do for about one hour early before the kids wake up is kind of like my own yoga stretching session on a early Sunday morning is like, that, that is my favorite day. Mm. So that I like that. Nice. That's a great routine. Jake, what you got? What do you do? So typically, I mean, I trail run a bunch in the winter. So that helps kind of get some cross training. My knees, obviously, the first week of trail running is absolutely brutal because my legs are just nuked. But like once mm -hmm. I start getting in routine a little bit, it feels a lot better. But um, typically after I get off Zwift, I'll do like, I always do like the age, how many push-ups, uh, how old I am in push-ups. Mm -hmm. So I usually do 32 push-ups. And then 
I do like probably 30 bodyweight squats just to kind of keep the legs moving. But then um, I do stretch after every Zwift session too, just to keep me going. But that's typically it, just Zwift running and then stretching and a little bit of push-ups here and there. So not much, but um, I do feel like it, <clears throat> it helps out quite a bit. So nice. Yeah. And I, I mean, Strava kind of opens up this world too. I mean, you watch, um, you know, some of these uh, mentors of ours that we look to, I mean, Aaron Jordan, he's constantly hiking, he's mixing in uh, running, Dave Sharp mixes in running. I mean, some of these guys are mixing in skiing that, that cross country skiing in the, in the winter with Peterson and uh, you know, Dan Braun, those guys are always mixing in the guys that we look to who are the strong ones. Uh, so I think it's a, I mean, I, I like that Dan's advice is do the thing that maybe you're like, oh man, I don't want to do that. That's a good, it's good advice. It's great advice. Well, um, we're coming in for a landing fellas. Any, any thoughts as we, as we wrap up, Dan, anything else you want to share with the team as we wrap up? Well, I just, uh, just reminded everybody, uh, it doesn't have to be me, but um, you're all fit enough and active enough that the primary way that you're going to access a healthcare system is going to be for musculoskeletal reasons. You're, mm. This group is not going to get diabetes or hypertension um, in most cases, uh, but the ability, you know, those of you that have have choices in terms of your healthcare, making sure that, you know, that the, the HSA that don't don't let the financial side be the barrier. And unfortunately, the insurance system is set up to try to make you fear using your money to, and that, that shouldn't be in the calculus at all. We, we've tried hard, at least in our clinic, to you know, provide a, a cash-based price that's pretty cheap. It's a, you know, almost half of what you know, the hospitals are charging. Uh, but even then, you know, the healthcare system, is, it, it makes it really tough to access. So it, as part of that, we're, we want to make sure that uh, at least among the dwellies that you guys know that you can always get uh, access to me for 15 minutes for free. And um, we'll just help you know, you know, is it a thing or not, you know, and sometimes the answer is, you know, cowboy up and just get back in the pain cave. Sometimes the answer is let's get you, let's get you an MRI and find out if there's something going on. Or sometimes the answer is um, this is, this is not what you think it is. We, I had a case and it wasn't a cyclist. I had a case last year that um, uh, a person who came in and thought she had torn her ACL and uh, she had, but it was a really wonky circumstance and something didn't sit right. And I had her come in a second time. And I said, you know, for some very specific special tests I did, I think there's something more going on. And I know you're gonna think I'm crazy, but I think we need to get a CT scan of your brain. And it turned out she had a golf ball size meningioma wow. and uh, she had brain surgery about seven days later. And, uh, you know, it was great to get the call from the surgeon that said, how in the world did this happen? And I said, well, she came in with an ACL. And uh, so I hope nobody out there has got a brain tumor. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, this is the, the, the benefit is that I'm paranoid to a fault probably on behalf of my patients and like I said, we'll give you 15 minutes of just trying to help you figure out where you're going to be happiest. Nice. You know, I, I tend not to say who my favorite surgeons are, or my least favorite are. Um, uh, if you ask me specific point blank, if I would go to somebody, um, I'll tell you, especially if they're in my top five or my bottom five. But outside of that, I try not to, you know, I don't hang out with these guys. I don't, you know, they're not my ski buddies or anything like that. I just want to send you to people who are good surgeons or going to do a good job. So. Nice. And I believe that. Thank you, Dan. And Dan, as you know, a uh, new sponsor of the team is his logos on your back. So you're wearing it on your back Jersey pocket. So we're super grateful, Dan, uh, for that. And then I'm going to leave your phone number and then website will link, be linked on the, on the podcast. So 801-938-9234 will get you to the clinic. And then the website, www.pr cpt.net um but i'll also include the link when you go to the notes of the show so thank you dan you bet guys good to be with you man Thanks, can't wait to see you outside of zwift let's pray yeah. for that day let's do no it doubt. No doubt. <laughs> thanks guys appreciate it Thanks, guys. Thanks,